Hello and welcome to another World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. In this episode, we're looking at the Western Desert in 1940-41, looking at the air campaign fought by Raymond Collishaw and his RAF crews. Collishaw was a World War I fighter race. When the war broke out in 1939, now Air Commodore Collishaw, he commanded an RAF group in Egypt. The fighting in the Western Desert in 1940 and early 41 is often overlooked. Yet, with his army counterpart Richard O'Connor, they scored some stunning successes. Collishaw's ideas on tactical air support would become the blueprint for Allied operations later in the war. But before I get started, just a quick reminder that this podcast is funded by patrons of the show like yourself. This kind of niche programming would not be possible on regular broadcast networks. Whilst download figures to me are pretty good with 30 or 40,000 downloads a month, I don't have advertisers throwing themselves at me to fund making the show. The funding of this show comes from those kind listeners who contribute a dollar or two each month. This patronage helps me to put the show together for everyone. So if you're interested in supporting the show, you can either go to www2podcast.com and click on donate or go to patreon.com slash www2podcast. Your support is invaluable to programming like this and I thank those who are already patrons of the show. So that's patreon.com slash www2podcast. So joining me today is Mike Bechtold. Mike is author of Flying to Victory, Raymond Collishaw and the Western Desert Campaign 1940-41. So thanks for joining me. Um, we're going to look at the early campaigns in the Western Desert. But before we get there, um, I wondered if we should we should maybe start earlier. Um, and at the start of the war and in those interwar years, how was the RAF expected to work with the army? It depends who you talk to. The RAF and, and the army never really played well together. The RAF coming out of the First World War was looking to set itself up as a, an independent service. And part of that was a question of doctrine in that they thought they could win a war, theories of Duhay and strategic bombing and everything like that. But there was also a real sense that they didn't want to get lost. They didn't want to become subservient to the Royal Navy or the army and uh, become sort of an ancillary service. So they had to find that independent mission that would allow them to exist as a third service. So there was always that tension between uh, the RAF and the Army because of that. Um, in many ways, the Army looked at the Flying Corps as subservient, that it should be there to service the Army, do uh, uh, reconnaissance, and in, in many ways be treated just like the artillery was. Uh, they didn't see it as independent. So th there's that tension. And the RAF was trying to do it on their own. And, and Kalashaw was really at the center of, of all that. Um, in uh, the First World War, I mean, everybody knows him as the, the great flying ace, if they know him at all. But in 1918, he was one of the first specialists in, in close air support. Uh, he was instrumental in leading his squadron during the, the March offensives to, to stop the Germans. And then the principal role of number 203 squadron that he commanded in the last 100 days campaign was providing support to the army on the battlefield. So the first uh, RAF officers that was there on the ground doing it, and he knew what worked and he, he knew what didn't work. And, and then in the interwar period, it was all about working with the other services in terms of his career. He went to uh, South Russia to fight the Bolsheviks. He was in uh, the Middle East and uh, Iraq and uh, Mesopotamia and places like that, fighting the insurgents. And then at the start of the Second World War, he was the senior, uh, one of the senior operational commanders in the Western Desert. So uh, he, he sort of worked his way through those systems. And as uh, he was probably as able as anybody to uh, to deal with the other services. Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. In the Western Desert, his uh, opposite number is um, Richard O'Connor, really, I think, isn't it? Above them, you've got Arthur, is Arthur Longmore and his Wavell, actual Wavell above them. Sorry, my mind went, <laughs> my mind went blank. Um, so are they are they all singing from the hem, same hymn sheet? I, you know, I, I did wonder if you know, the North, the North East, the Middle East was sort of 
if almost if Doc Trinley had come up with his own thing separate, say, from the BEF in France. Yeah, and they kind of talk and they kind of trade lessons, but really um, they don't cooperate as well as they could. They don't share what they learn as well as they could. And part of that is because the connections aren't there. And part of it is because there's this, I think, misplaced understanding that the situations are different in each case and they're not transferable, which I think is demonstrably wrong. But uh, O'Connor and, and, and Kalashaw got along as well as as any two um, Army and Air Force officers did during the war. They understood each other. They knew what each other needed. They were willing to provide it. Um, their egos didn't get involved, which you can't say very often in, in these kind of relationships. And uh, they formed a, a really good working relationship uh, early on. Um, Kalashaw had his, his headquarters co-located with O'Connor, and uh, they worked together uh, intimately. That changed later on as the campaign developed. Connor had to move closer to the front. Kalashaw had to stay with his squadrons uh, because the campaign was sufficient to allow him to, uh, to move around. Uh, early on, they had it all figured out. So what, what resources, because the Italians had a vast army when they, you know, when they invade in mid, in, 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 across the Egyptian border in mid forty. Um, how did their forces compare to what the RAF and Collishaw had to hand? Oh, I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but the uh, Regia Aeronautica, the uh, Italian Royal Air Force, was considerably larger than uh, than the Royal Air Force was, and the, the Italian Army was also uh, much bigger than the, the British forces on the ground. And they also had a, a big advantage um, geographically in that Italy was just ac- across the Mediterranean Sea, so they could easily get uh, reinforcements and replacements and uh, logistics uh, arrangements, whereas uh, the uh, the British had to reinforce from the UK or from North America or from India and had much more tenuous uh, lines of communications. Probably the biggest thing that the British had going for them was that they were willing to think outside of the box. And Operation Compass, the, the victory over the Italians, was really a, a victory that was... Um, going outside of the box. They weren't acting as if they were the smaller, inferior force. They acted as if they were the dominant force and just pressed the advantage. And the Italians let them. There's no way that that victory should have ever happened, um, given the, the uh, distance, uh, the differences in the size of the forces and everything like that. But um, O'Connor, and, and ably supported by Kalashaw, seized the initiative and, and got the Italians on the wrong foot. And then they didn't let go. I think one of the, the great battles during Operation Compass was the, the capture of Bardia. Craig Stockings in uh, Australia has written a fabulous book on, uh, on that battle that focuses right in on, on the Australian capture of, of the, the town. But the Italians had a, a huge garrison there. It was well defended. It was well equipped. And uh, the British and Australians and uh, supported by the RAF were able to reduce it in, in almost no time at all. Partly it was because of the audacity, but uh, the one argument I make is that it was also one of the first uh, really well put together combined arms attacks. Or, or It was the, the army supported by the RAF and the Royal Navy. And uh, they talked, they planned, they came up with a, a good concept of operations and then they worked together to make that victory happen. I would argue that if uh, the RAF and the RN, RN hadn't worked well with the army, there's no way they could have uh, broken that uh, uh, encampment. So how were the RAF employed in that instance? They were employed the way they should be and the way they were later in the war. They started off with uh, reconnaissance. They went in, they looked, they figured out what the uh, Italian defenses were. And uh, then before the, the army attacked, they went in and they, they tried to reduce as many positions as they could. The Navy tackled uh, positions that were really close to the coast. The RAF attacked the, the outposts along the, the interior and uh, reduced them, got them worried, got them uh, cut off, uh, destroyed barbed wire entanglements, uh, cut communications cables and everything like that. And then when... The Australians attacked, they lifted their attack. So instead of attacking right in front of uh, the Australians, which is going to cause a, a blue on blue uh, friendly fire thing, they moved inland more and uh, worked to 
keep dislocating the Italians, slow their transfer of forces, deal with their artillery to uh, degrade its performances and things like that, and really made a, a quite a substantial contribution to the, the victory. I mean, Collishaw is helped by the fact that uh, it's Arthur Longmore, his, his CEO, that, you know, he, he insists that targets you know, must be beyond the army's battle space. And Collishaw's, you know, no proponent of um, bombing frontline front line positions and moving, you know, moving target, moving, you know, armoured targets. Why did they come to this uh, decision? Because in some respects, you know, people talk about, you know, the Blitzkrieg and you've got the Stokers coming in as mobile artillery, and this is not what they're proponents of. No, the RAF couldn't do close support. I would argue they couldn't do close support even in Normandy in the way that the uh, the army wanted them to do, which is taking on targets on the immediate frontage of the uh, the army. Kalshaw learned this as early as 1918 um, during the Amiens offensive, and he knew that to attack targets on the battlefield, it's extremely expensive in terms of uh, aircraft and pilots. Uh, targets are well defended, they're difficult to find, they're difficult to hit, And you're not going to be very effective. Where the Air Force can be effective is attacking targets beyond the battlefield, attacking supply lines, attacking reinforcements, interdicting movement to and from the battlefield. And that's where they can be really effective. That's where their uh, strength can be. I had a really interesting experience about 15 years ago in Normandy where uh, I had uh, rented a small airplane to to go up and take some pictures of the Normandy battlefields. I took off from uh, Carpiquet Airfield, which is just outside of Caen, right in the center of, of the bridgehead. And as soon as we got up in the air, you could see the D-Day beaches, you could see Aromanche, you can see the Caen River and Caen Canal, and everything is really easy to find. So we flew north first over the, the Canadian battlefields, and I can see all the little towns where the, the Canadians fought. We went to uh, Aromanche and looked at the, the remnants of the, the Mulberry Harbor. Flew along the coast, uh, Gold Juno Sword Beaches, down the Con Canal, over Con. But as soon as I got south of Con, it became very difficult to pick out things because it's just a, not a featureless battlefield, but it's not as easy to landmark things. So we, uh, we found a few things and, but it was much harder to identify even towns, let alone specific points of interest. And we kept flying south to Falaise. It was easy to find Falaise. But then we wanted to find a little village called Saint Lambert sur Dive, which is um, sort of in the center of what became known as the Falaise Pocket. It's where the Canadians engaged the, the Germans as they were trying to escape the, the pocket. And we couldn't find it. This was a summer afternoon, perfect sunlight, uh, no clouds. We were flying really low, and the, the pilot I had was his home base was Falaise, so maybe 15 miles from this village where we were trying to, to look. And we couldn't find it. it. It really put home a lesson to me that these pilots during the war that are going to be flying much higher, much faster, in uh, much more terrible conditions with people shooting at them. It, and it, it really sh- sort of showed how difficult it is to find those kind of pinpoint targets. We couldn't find a village, let alone a uh, uh, a gun position or a tank or something that's camouflaged. So it, it's something that's very easily said and much more difficult to, to do. And you have to give a lot of props to the the pilots that actually made it work day in and day out. Yeah, well, I, I wondered if that's part of the problem that they you know, will say that they continually have is the army complaining uh, that they're not giving any support. What they actually mean is the army can't see the support that's being given. Uh, the poor bloody infantry wants to see the planes above them and it's not, it's elsewhere. So they sit there thinking, well, what are the RAF doing? Where is our air support? And it's elsewhere, interdicting. That's that's it exactly. And that uh, sums up the whole uh, British experience in, in Compass in a few words. Even the British Army, and, and O'Connor knew better, so he was able to uh, dissuade his uh, lower-level commanders of this, wanted uh, an air umbrella posted, because as soon as the Italians showed up and bombed a, a few frontline positions or artillery guns and things like that, the army's screaming for air cover. We need air cover. We can't have these attacks happen. Even though the attacks really didn't cause all that much damage, but they still wanted the air cover, Kalashaw and, and O'Connor were able to say, no, this isn't the best use, and, and carry on with with the things that actually worked. The Italians, on the other hand, fell into that trap hook, line, and, and sinker. The uh, Italian army commanders say we're, we're getting hit 
uh, by the RAF. We need air cover. And they used the vast strength of their air force to protect the army and flew these constant air umbrellas over their troops, which are an incredible waste of resource because you're defensive. You're not going to be very effective because you can't have the aircraft up there all the time or in the right spot at the right time. So these uh, sorties are, are essentially wasted. They're, uh, they're not doing anything constructive in protecting your troops. And the opportunity cost is even greater in that they're not pressing home their, their advantage and attacking targets they could actually hit and, and destroy. RAF airfields, uh, for example, or logistics trucks coming up from the rear or uh, lighters and, and freighters coming along the coast to supply. Like the, Air, the, the Italian Air Force had the chance to be decisive in that campaign and they uh, frittered away their strength in these air umbrellas. Yeah, and presumably you're also eating into machine uh, airtime. So you're putting stress on your machine and your servicing crews for a little result as well. And supplies for parts. And, and everything in the desert always seems to come back to supplies and long supply routes. And it, it really does. And one of the statistics that just blows my mind is that the British captured hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Italian aircraft as they advanced. And some of them were... 100% working condition, but most of them were, were broken down for very minor reasons, uh, a flat tire or an air filter or fuel, fuel filter that needed to be replaced. And uh, Italians had to abandon them just because they had no way to reclaim them, to fly them away to safety or to get the parts in place and stuff like that. By comparison, when the Germans attacked in, in March 41 and uh, routed the British and sent them all the way out of uh, Libya, uh, the RAF lost only a handful of aircraft, and most of those had been hit in bombing attacks by the Luftwaffe, and they uh, they didn't have to abandon any aircraft for um, want of of supplies or or spare parts. That's it, because that's interesting. The, the British supply line is even more tenuous than the Italian supply. I mean, the British supply line for bringing in the. If I've just read the obituary of a chap who's just died, it comes in somehow through West Africa. Uh, it's a really lo long, convoluted way they would bring in su supplies for like the hurricanes and things. Yeah, a lot of the single-engine fighters that were uh, being used in the Western Desert were brought in by a, a method called the Takarati route, where they would be uh, shipped oftentimes in boxes to uh, the port of Takarati in, in West Africa, taken off the ships, um, put into flyable condition, and then flown right across the width of Africa and then up the Nile Valley to, uh, to Egypt. And it was long, it was arduous, uh, they lost a lot of aircraft and, and pilots uh, making that happen. But in the early days, it was the only way to get uh, those single-engine fighters to Egypt and, and to Libya to support Kalashaw. Yeah, as you say, it's remarkable then that they lost so much as, they, as the Germans, uh, Germans advanced. Um, Kalashaw would be criticised um, for being overly aggressive. Um, presumably this criticism was also, you know... Uh, would be leveled at him for a compass um and i wondered if he'd faced the same criticism in 1944 uh, as he did it during his time in the desert yeah well kolashaw once he was relieved from command in in the desert in uh the summer of 41 he went back to england and uh by 1943 he'd been retired so that was the end of his war so he didn't get back into uh uh combat as a commander again but you know, I mean, if you know, my, my, I was I was getting at you know, he was seen as being aggressive because he wasn't fighting a defensive battle, and I wondered if uh, you know later on in the war everyone was fighting the battle that he fought, but at the time, it was <laughs> it was seen as being overly aggressive. Yeah, well, uh, the problem was that he didn't have any replacements. So to give you an idea of scale, uh, early on, Kalasha had exactly one hurricane fighter. The, the rest of his fighters were uh, biplanes, uh, gladiators that were very effective in the desert because the main Italian fighter was also a, a biplane. But early on, he had exactly one hurricane and uh, they ended up calling this plane uh, Cully's uh, battleship because he used it to uh, greatest effect. He uh, took a couple of uh, Blenheims, which is usually a, a light medium bomber, and uh, added some machine guns to the front of those to turn it into a, a twin-engine fighter. And he would pair the one Hurricane with uh, these two Blenheim fighters and uh, use them aggressively against the Italians. And he hid the fact that they only had one Hurricane by employing it all the time. He would 
move it from airfield to airfield. He would rotate the pilots to keep it flying much more often than you would usually see one aircraft flying. And uh, it gave the uh, the appearance of, of strength that wasn't actually there. And Kalashaw had to be careful because these were all irreplaceable uh, assets. Uh, you lose that hurricane and, and it's done. You're not going to get another one for quite a while. And at one point during the campaign, he was criticized for being overly aggressive because they took some losses. But I've gone through the records and... Um, the the criticisms were were misplaced the uh sanctions were sent down but they really didn't apply because of the the situation it wasn't the losses weren't a result of Kalashaw being overly aggressive they were just sort of a, a happenstance of the way that things took place and it wasn't because Kalashaw was pushing his men and, and squadrons too hard it was just sort of those kind of losses that happen in warfare. I mean, Kalashaw, more than anybody, was understanding of what it's like to be at the end of a long and tenuous supply line. He'd been doing it since 1919 when he was in uh, South Russia. So more than anybody, he understood that. And uh, I think you also have to look at at Longmore, that um, Longmore had the utmost confidence in in Kalashaw right through this entire period in a way that he didn't have uh, in any other uh, commander. There was a, a few occasions when uh, Longmore was offered a replacement for Kalashaw to have Kalashaw moved off to a different possession position um, in East Africa or in the Middle East or, or something like that. And he consistently refused, saying, no, the one guy that I need here by my side doing what he's doing now is, is Kalashaw. And, and that speaks uh, quite a lot about uh, his uh, abilities. Well, it's interesting at that, you know, that point at the end of uh, Compass where... Um O'Connor and Collishaw kind of stood down and moved out from from that uh, frontier, that uh, border, which now goes quiet as forces are drawn off to Greece. Uh, Longmore is withdrawn. I think he goes back to the UK. Or, and, and anyway, Ted is, sort of comes out. And it's at that moment you, you've got this, you've had a great team of a perfect set of operations. And it's almost at this point, obviously the Germans arrive, so it's a difference. There's it's been levelled that the Germans are a much more a problematic uh, enemy than the soft Italians, but it's certainly from this point where it all becomes well, I would say it starts to go wrong. It all becomes it almost like they have to go back and relearn everything or convince everybody that they would do, what they were doing was right. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, it, it makes total sense because there is this um, tendency to dismiss what happened in Compass completely and totally because, well, it was against the IDs. It was against the Italians. That's just a second, maybe even a third class uh, opponent. And yeah, we had our way with them. But when it's the Germans, it's going to be a totally different story. So at the end of of Compass, um, everybody was exhausted. Forces needed time to regenerate and and reinforce and repair and everything like that. Kalasha was sent back to the uh, the Nile Delta. O'Connor was moved back as well. And they gave some other guys a chance to, to get the thing done. And uh, the RAF commander was uh, Brown, who was actually quite an exceptional guy. And uh, Neem was the army commander. And not necessarily through their faults, although I would probably argue that the army didn't do all they could to forestall the, the German uh, attack. Um, all of a sudden, uh, Rommel pressed his advantage and, and kept pushing and all of a sudden had the British uh, in full-fledged retreat. And uh, as soon as it was clear that things weren't going that way, Kalashaw was called back and, and sent out to reclaim command of the RAF in the field. And uh, O'Connor was also sent forward to uh, to take over his former position. And unfortunately, with O'Connor, he went out to do a reconnaissance and ended up getting lost and, and subsequently captured. And uh, that was the end of his story in, in North Africa. But uh, Kalashaw took over and, and really got the RAF back on a solid footing. How did he play a defensive role? You know, what what did he change the uh, strategy for defense as opposed to uh, offensive compass? Most of the principles are the same. It was all about keeping your forces as far away as they could. So sending flights off for bombing the, the German ports, uh, trying to interdict the ships coming across to resupply and, and reinforce the uh, Axis forces, uh, keeping the pressure on uh, Tobruk to make sure that uh, that port isn't captured, because that was sort of the one thing that was able to hold out uh, against Rommel at that point. And uh, the Australians held on to Tobruk and, and didn't let it go, and, and the RAF did everything they could. And in some ways, that was the focal point of the battle, uh, the air battle at that point. The RAF um, 
was really uh, made defensive at that point because the the Luftwaffe and and the Italian air forces were both attacking Tobruk very hard, and they weren't able to stop those attacks, but they were able to interfere with them enough that the Luftwaffe wasn't able to be decisive in turning the tide in the way that the RAF had been at Bardia and also in the initial capture of, of Tobruk in uh, January 1941. So there's a sort of a, a brouhaha, isn't there, at Tobruk, where they actually, uh, Collishaw wants to remove the planes from Tobruk, whereas it's, I wonder if Tedder is much better politician than Collishaw, you know, so Collishaw wants to move the planes from Tobruk perimeter because they're losing them lost 27 of 32 planes and only 11 hurricanes left in the Middle East. So he wants to move them with, from the, with, with the perimeter, but Ted, he's not supported by Tedder. And I wonder if that's, you know, because Tedder's playing the political game of not wanting to get the backup of the army and suffer that criticism, where Collishaw is perhaps blinkered to those uh, political machinations and is just trying to, uh, well, fight, fight the battle and not worry about the consequences politically. Yeah, Tedder, Tedder certainly has a, a better concept of the, the political scope of all, all this stuff that's going on. Tedder's a really interesting character in this early period because Tedder goes on to be one of the great RAF commanders of the Second World War. Um, he proves that from, I would argue, El Alamein and, and Sicily on through the Normandy campaign. And he uh, shows that he really understands the RAF. He understands the, the politics of working with the army. He understands um, what the mission of the RAF is um, in terms of furthering the war effort. But I'm not sure he quite got it in 1940, 1941. I think he was still learning and he had the general idea right, but he still hadn't figured it all out. Then I think you also have to toss into the fact that Tedder hated Kalashaw, um, which is very clear from his writings, both during the war, he wrote quite scathing critiques of, of Collishaw back to uh, to London to both Air Marshal uh, Air Chief Marshal Freeman, Wilfred Freeman, and to uh, Portal, who was Chief of the Air Staff, saying that he was very unhappy with Collishaw. And there's really no basis for it that I can understand. One of the big things I was not able to find out in my book was where this animosity came from. Um, because it's very clear from the time Tedder first shows up in the Western Desert in December 1940 that he doesn't like Kalashaw and he wants to get rid of him right away. To me, that says there's some pre-existing animosity. This isn't a, a judgment or a view that was formed on the spot, but it's uh, sort of a pre-existing condition. And I'm 100% sure that something happened between them in the preceding 20 years that turned Tedder against Kalashaw. And, and I, I don't know what it was, but undoubtedly they crossed paths. I couldn't find an exact place where they were posted together or something like that. But they, they crossed paths over and over again in, in the UK and in the Middle East and uh, various other places. I mean, Kalashaw was, was that kind of fighter pilot personality. He was loud. He was boisterous. He enjoyed his drink. Uh, there's there's great stories of him, uh, even when he was uh, commanding in the Western Desert, that he'd be the last man standing in the mess, uh, even when all the, the young pilots had sort of fallen over and been dragged back to their bunks and, and Kalashaw was still going. Tedder, however, was, was the exact opposite. He was a, a very studious, uh, academic type. He drank, but certainly not to excess. He wouldn't have been the life of the party in the mess in the way that Kalashaw was. So right there, you can see that kind of personality conflict that could possibly develop there. But I, I, I'd i be willing to bet that in the mess, sometime, somewhere in the 1930s, maybe even the 1920s, the two of them crossed paths and Kalashaw did something that soured Tedder on him. And Tedder, I think, is one to hold a grudge. And uh, he held a grudge so that when he got to the Western Desert, um, it was it was quite evident that he was going to get rid of Kalashaw as soon as he could. Like I said, Tedder became... A great commander. I don't think we saw his best work in, in the Western Desert. And to me, the best example of that is Operation Battleaxe. Battleaxe was the, uh, the British offensive in June 1941 that was uh, uh, an attack designed to push the Germans back and uh, liberate uh, Tobruk. And the British have quite a numerical advantage at this point as well, don't they? Yeah, especially in tanks. Um, Churchill liked his, he called them his tiger cubs. 
Um, and it had made some uh, quite difficult decisions to send uh, substantial reinforcements out to the Middle East. You have to remember this is a time when uh, the Battle of Britain has been won, but there's still a, an imminent threat of uh, an invasion in the British Isles, and the British are desperately trying to uh, reinforce their army, build up their strength after losing most of the equipment in, in France with uh, the Dunkirk evacuation. So Churchill really sort of put things on the line by sending as much as he did to the Middle East and had uh, great expectations for the uh, the battle axe offensive. And uh, battle axe didn't go as well as it, it was expected. It was a, a battle that could have gone either way, but it just sort of the way it worked out, uh, Rommel was able to get his forces in place on time and uh, managed to... Uh, contain the uh, the armored thrusts and stop battle axe and Tobruk wasn't relieved and uh, the British had quite substantial losses in uh, both infantry and and uh, tanks which were quite irreplaceable at that point. The reason I say I don't think Tedder was sort of at the top of his game at this point was that rather than trust Kalashaw to run the battle that he'd run during uh, Compass which was sort of taking the battle to the uh, the, the enemy doing interdiction, attacking distant targets, uh, slowing the flow of reinforcements to the front. He uh, bought into the army's line saying, we need an air umbrella. We need uh, intimate defense. And so for the first two days of the battle, rather than being free to sort of attack the targets of opportunity, and there were a lot, um, and I think it maybe could have made a difference in the battle, Kalashaw had to task his planes to fly cover over the British Army and lost any impact that aircraft could have, have had to play in the success of the battle. Um, by the third day, it was clear things were going wrong. Tedder was being pressed from London saying, what's the RAF doing? Why aren't they attacking? So he finally unleashed the RAF. And uh, I, I think that uh, it was too late at that point to turn the tide of the battle. But what the RAF was able to do was to stop a, a much more complete Axis victory and uh, give the uh, the army the time they needed to escape with some semblance of, of order rather than being encircled and destroyed, which is how it was looking to be going um, by the end of the second day. And I'm, I'm not sure what Tedder's game was here. I'd like to say that he was still learning, that he was still trying to figure things out. He'd been told different things by Portal. Part of it is to sort of support the army in any way he could, and I think he took that to mean to do what the army says, because there'd been a, a lot of criticism of the RAF in the, the preceding months. The uh, the army was quite critical of the RAF for not playing a more substantial role during the initial uh, German offensive. Or, or scapegoating them, is, it, is what I wondered. Well, well, exactly, scapegoating them. And it was even worse over uh, Greece and Crete. They were like very unhappy with uh, the RAF. I mean, they're being attacked by Stukas. They're saying, where's the RAF? For the, the British Army in Greece, the uh, the RAF became the royal absent force, and uh, they just weren't happy. So I think maybe part of Tedder's goal was to do what the army wanted. Um, I'm not sure he had an understanding of how disastrous that could be. Um, the cynic in me says that he knew exactly how bad it was going to be, and he did it as a way of proving to the army that doing these kind of uh, close support air umbrella operations is a recipe for disaster so as to set up the RAF in future battles to do uh, what they need to do. I don't think that's the case. That would be a, a pretty terrible indictment of, of Tedder, but it is one possible explanation of what he was doing, that he was playing the long game here and he knew he was going to sacrifice battle acts for the greater good of the RAF. But I think that's that's maybe reading a little bit too much into it. I wondered if he didn't feel secure enough to fight his own his own corner, so he uh, deferred. Yeah, and I mean, Tedder certainly was in a very tenuous position at, at this point. Um, he came really close to getting sacked by uh, Churchill on a couple of occasions just after this, and it, it uh, was really lucky that he had such strong patrons in, in Portal and Freeman to uh, uh, stand up for him and make sure that didn't happen. So I, I think you're right. I think that Tedder was doing the best he could and trying to keep everybody happy at that point. But it's also clear that during this battle, he was wrong and Kalashaw was right. 
And, and, and you mentioned Churchill. This is what you know, he's usually criticised for micro, his micromanagement of, of the war and his uh, his own Ministry of Defence. But in the post mortem of what, what went wrong in Battle Axe, this is one of the, one of those strange moments where uh, it where he needed someone from the shop and top top and Churchill seems to have his, his, an epiphany and the RAF get his seem to have his complete backing from absolutely the top. From there on in, what happened there? Yeah, Churchill's the real hero in this story because um, whether or not Tedder intended for Battle Axe to show sort of the strengths and weaknesses of the various concepts of employing the RAF, it worked. And Churchill got it in a way that is, is like you say, an epiphany because before Battle Axe, he was much more in the army corner. He uh, was of the opinion that the RAF hadn't done as much as they could do in, in Greece and Crete and was critical of them. But in the aftermath of Battle Axe, it's very clear that he came almost 180 degrees in his viewpoint, that he uh, understood what the the opportunities were in using the RAF in, in the way that it had been in, in Compass. And and he, he stood on that. He uh, ran roughshod over um, the uh, the army commanders on the, the Chiefs of Staff Committee. Uh, he told them that this is the way it's going to be done. And he really set the RAF for success later in the war because without his pronouncements, um, without him stepping up and saying essentially that the RAF had a separate battle to fight, that they would support the army, but they also had their own objectives and goals and, and things to do. They weren't going to be used in uh, air umbrellas ever again, that they had an offensive mission to, to do, that that really set the stage for the success of the Desert Air Force under uh, uh, Conningham. Uh, the victory at El Alamein, and then pushing the, the Germans out of, of North Africa. And then once that pattern had been set up, it became the, the working situation for the RAF in, and the U.S. Army Air Forces in Normandy and Northwest Europe for the remainder of the war. So uh, Churchill really read and understood what had happened, why it had happened, what went wrong, what we need to take from it. And he pushed through an agenda that really changed the the dynamic of army air force relations for the rest of the war so i was quite surprised he hadn't jumped on it earlier because you know it's very much the wanting to fight a battle that's the you know it's getting at the enemy it's not fighting a defensive battle it's not an error but it's very churchill let's he was always one to get up and at him as opposed to you know holding back for defensives you know so that the the the, the battle that they were wanting to fight uh, I'm quite surprised they, he almost hadn't picked up on it earlier, though. Who's to say he hadn't really you know, zeroed in on that? He did have quite a lot on his, on his plate. So, and this is where, you know, as you say, Collishaw's vindicated and and reassigned. What excuse do they have for reassigning him? That, that's the other big question mark I have in, in uh, understanding what happened to Collishaw. In, in the way that Tedder had patrons in London, Collishaw didn't have that. So he uh, he doesn't have anybody to stand up for him when Tedder says, OK, you've done your time. You're going back to the UK. I think that was probably the right decision. Kalashad had been there uh, in the desert for quite a long time. He probably needed a change of scenery. Um, he went back to the UK. He worked in fighter command for a while, um, had a couple other positions and ultimately ended up in the north in Scotland commanding uh, is it 13 group up there. But it's really clear that's putting him out to pasture because by that point, the Battle of Britain was over. 13 Group really wasn't anything more than a uh, an area to rest squadrons that were, were doing the real fighting uh, down in the south. I think there was also some health issues. Um, Kalashaw spent some time in and out of the hospital in late 42 and, and early 43. Um, but ultimately, he retired in, in mid-1943. And it's interesting, in his autobiography, he's, he doesn't say... Uh, I chose to retire or it was time to retire. He says, I was retired. <laughs> There's a conversation somewhere, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So he, and he leaves it at that. He doesn't explore it. Um, I haven't found anywhere in his extensive writings after the war, um, him going back and, and talking about that. But it, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, he wasn't too old. His contemporaries, uh, men who he, went through uh, the RAF staff college with, uh, came up through the ranks commanding. They were all of the same experience, of roughly the same age. <clears throat> some were older, some were younger. And uh, to take a man with, with Kalashaw's experience and retire him in the middle of a shooting war, 
doesn't make any sense. So uh, there, there's something more going on here that I haven't been able to, to track down. Um, and I'm not sure I ever will be able to track it down. But uh, yeah, it, it's one of the outstanding questions from this. I wonder if it's his face doesn't fit for some reason, or I, but I couldn't think why. There's a, there's you know there are other people who sort of suddenly get uh, retired, and they're usually fit, face fitting. So as you say, I wonder, I wonder if he's uh, ruffled some feathers at some staff college course or something along those lines. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm sure that it, it has everything to do with the personalities involved. I mean. Um, Oh, I forget his name right now. The commander during the Battle of Britain. Um, Dowding. Hugh Dowding. Yeah. <laughs> well, he, I mean, he was in a similar situation. He was much older. He was supposed to retire before the Battle of Britain, but he ended up uh, commanding during the Battle of Britain. Uh, he did a fantastic job. Um, there were criticisms of him, but then he was ultimately retired shortly after the end of the battle in the middle of the war. And uh, it's just one of those things that kind of makes you uh, scratch your head. But I mean, I, I think with Kalashaw, one of the biggest things, like I said, is he didn't have a patron. He didn't have that senior commander that uh, sort of had taken him under his wing and was going to protect him and and protect his career, shepherd him through appointments and so forth. And I mean, the closest you would have to that is Longmore. Uh, but Longmore was also kind of shuffled off and didn't do anything much after uh, he left the Middle East. So, uh, yeah, there was nobody there to sort of make sure that he remained in, in contention and other people came up and lots of very capable men that uh, got the job done. But uh, yeah, Kalashaw wasn't part of that equa- equation. So I, I made a note to myself, maverick outsider. <laughs> was he a maverick outsider? I, I think that's a good thing. Some people have said it's because he was Canadian, but I don't think that's the case at all. I mean, you look at the upper ranks of the RAF and there's lots of uh, colonials in there. Uh, Conningham's probably the the best example, but uh, there was quite a few of the the senior commanders who were from Australia or New Zealand or, or places like that, and uh, so I don't I don't think that's a good example of a, a good reason of why Collishaw was sort of put out. Is Collishaw remembered in Canada? I mean, it's certainly in the UK. I mean, I'd, I'd never heard of him. For the most part, no. Um, Billy Bishop is, I mean, if anybody knows any uh, First War Canadian pilot, it's Billy Bishop, who was the the, the great air ace, uh, 72 kills, and sort of leading all uh, British Commonwealth uh, pilots. Kalashaw was second with 60. I mean, that whole issue of kills is, is uh, a story for another day in, in terms of an a- analyzing it. But the fact that he was credited with uh, 60 destroyed over the Western Front is, is quite remarkable, and you would think he would be better known, but he's really not. There's a, an airport named for him in Nanaimo, BC, which is his hometown on Vancouver Island. But for the most part, that's, that's about it. Um, there's still not a, a really good biography of him. His autobiography is quite good, but it's, like most of those things, a little self-serving at times, and not accurate. Convenient holes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, Kalashaw was kind of an old school gentleman and, and didn't really criticize even when I think he could. Um, and if he, if there's anything that's the least bit controversial, he's just left it out, which is, I don't think, a bad way to do things. But I think he's, he's worthy of, of, uh, greater notoriety, of greater a- attention and, uh, I think my next big project is going to be to do that full-blown biography of him that takes him from uh, being a, a junior officer in the Canadian Fisheries Patrol Service before the First World War, uh, look at his First World War career, his interwar career, and then revisit the Western Desert. But he had quite a long life. Even though he retired in 1943, he didn't pass away until 1976. He moved back to Canada after the war, um, was very involved in various mining pursuits, um, copper mining and, and I think gold mining. And he became something of a, an amateur historian. He uh, kept up a, a really extensive correspondence with people all over the world about especially exploits in the First World War. He was really interested in things like tallying kills, um, trying to figure out squadron rosters, not just British, but uh, German, French, Austrian, uh, you name it. He was really interested in questions like who killed the, the Red Baron, who shot down the Red Baron. And you can find extensive letters back and forth with different people trying to figure it out, hand-drawn maps, things like that. And uh, 
I think there's a, an interesting story to tell there as well. Yeah, well, it is funny how these guys, you know, before El Alamein are sort of forgotten in the in the desert. It's even though it's the only place that we were really fighting the Germans because we weren't winning. Yeah, well, there's there's I forget how the quote goes, but there's uh, surely uh, one quick way to uh, notoriety, and that's to uh, be a, a commanding general at the start of a war because you kind of suffer through all the early defeats and uh, later on when victory happens, you're not there and you kind of get forgotten in the story. And I think that's really the case of, of Kalashaw. Well, yeah, with, uh, yeah, especially it's such a shame because, you know, Com- Compass was so good. And it's such a shame that everyone then sort of berates them when you, you, you point out, well, the Italians are a third rate, third rate force. And those Germans were much harder. And I'm not sure they necessarily were. They were just more aggressive and that, that, so much had been drawn off to Greece that there, it was only a, a, a thin red line that was along the border against Rommel to start with anyway. So you know, that helped. <laughs> yeah, well, and I, I think one of the things really going against um, Kalashaw's memory is the fact that Tedder was um, so uh, against him. He not only uh, got rid of him as, as quickly as he could, but then he kind of went out of his way after the war to make sure that Kalashaw wasn't remembered. If you read uh, Tedder's memoirs uh, with prejudice, um, he really is prejudiced against uh, Kalashaw in a, a way that he doesn't attack uh, anybody else. He uh, called him a, a bull in a china shop. He said he had a tendency to go off at the half cock. And he had this other famous uh, passage where he says something that uh, uh, Kalashaw was the, the village... Um, uh, village cricket player when first rate cricket is ready to be played or something like that, which is a, a very British way of saying that he was a uh, sort of a minor league player, not ready for the big league. Yeah. yeah and, that, and that seems somewhat unfair. Mike, that was great. It, it seems like a good place to finish. If you're interested in the Western desert during the early part of the war, Mike's book is flying to victory, Raymond Collishaw and the Western desert campaign, 1940, 41. I have a link on the website and it's in the bookstore on the site. Also, if you're not familiar with the desert at this time, it's well worth reading. And also, for more background, you can listen to episode 11 of the podcast where I discuss Richard O'Connor with Mark Buna. Don't forget, if you want more World War II, you can find me on Facebook, WW2 Podcast. I do regularly post things in support of the current episode. And if you have a spare dollar, and would like to support the show, it's patreon.com slash ww2podcast or click donate on ww2podcast.com. I hope you enjoyed that. Thanks for listening.